Я э, хотела бы представить нашего первого докладчика Бренда Ю из Национального университета Сингапура, который представит нашему вниманию доклад «Пути к эсмотрицизму. Миграция Голландии, среда, брака в городе-государстве Сингапур». Singapore, 
and uh, he basically planned Singapore in terms of um, ethnic kampongs or ethnic precincts. Uh, so, for example, um, you can't quite see, but uh, Chinatown is on the um, south of the of the Singapore River. Uh, the Malay kampong is um, on the North River. Uh, the European town would be. Uh, in a different area here where there's a, a, a town square and so forth. So the idea being that um, it was very much a divide and rule kind of principle to try to uh, cope with the multiple, uh, well, the, with a plural society in, in Singapore. So that's uh, basically lasted through colonial times. And by the time we get to independence, uh, Singapore became independent in 1965, um, and um, the nation state was newly founded, and there was uh, the challenge of trying to build a nation state out of the plural fragments of colonial society. And the emphasis here in the nation building philosophy is to emphasize economic nationalism, uh, as well as the welding together of the heterogeneous groups into so-called one people on the basis of what's been called the four N's plus, plus N. And what does that mean? Uh, basically, the, um, against a backdrop of a plural society with racialized categories that are quite hardened by colonial policy, the new national leaders had a uh, little choice but to think of uh, a way of welding the people together on the basis of this uh, 4Ms plus M, which is a kind of multiracialism often known as separate but equal multiracialism. The 4Ms refers to multiracialism, multiculturalism, multilingualism, and multireligiosity. Uh, and um, the, the, the separate fifth M is meritocracy as a way of uh, governing um, or, or rule making amongst the different groups. The, the groups in, um, are designated as official races and in Singapore we have Chinese, the majority race, Malays, a substantial minority, Indians, also a substantial minority and a category called others. So this is known as a CMIO model of multiracialism um, where the four official groups are seen to be separate but equal. Um, there's encouragement of coexistence of different religious practices, customs, and so forth, without discrimination for any particular community. And you would see in um, all the various iconic photographs that are produced um, during this time would be, for example, you'll see the Singapore flag and believe it would be uh, four children, each one representing one race, Chinese, Malay, Indian, and other child, uh, lined up in a very orderly fashion, uh, again, to symbolize the four separate but equal ra races. Um, and um, meritocracy is, in a sense, uh, meant to be that rule that will ensure that no one race is favored over another, but of course, uh, meritocracy could also function as a means of disempowering uh, groups because it erases the grounds upon which racial groups could make claims on their own behalf. Um, so, again, that's really a very short history of, of the, the, the foundations of the nation state uh, and um, the multiracial ideology that Singapore was built upon. Uh, I will have to quickly turn to the last couple of decades, basically, where the multiracial philosophy has been faced with uh, a number of different challenges as a result of very rapid immigration. So by the turn of the 21st century, one of the issues has to do with declining fertility rates among the citizen population and, um, and that is, in some ways, uh, compensated for by very aggressive immigration policies uh, and the, the, two, two, the declining citizen uh, fertility rate plus the uh, very high immigration uh, rate has led to a much higher degree of diversity than can be coped with within the CMIO model. So if you a very quick look at uh, the rapid fertility decline, um, well, as the, the newspaper says, I mean, the stock hasn't been doing its job, the population isn't replacing itself, 
So from a relatively high um, fertility rate uh, in the 60s, just after independence, fertility has declined very rapidly uh, to well below replacement. So the current um, fertility rate is, in 2009, it was 1.22. And um, I've just checked the more recent one. It's, it's gone even further now to 1.11, I think. So, um, so the line you should be looking at would be the, the blue, blue line, that's the total fertility uh, decline. The, the other lines represent the different races. Um, and uh, what we can see there is that the green line, the line that's, that's the highest fertility, that's the Malay population that traditionally had uh, more children, I mean, uh, and, and kept the fertility rate up. But even amongst the Malay population, fertility rate has come right down and is now below replacement. The little blips and sort of uh, troughs and peaks represent um, sort of the year, of, for example, the year of the dragon. Uh, according to Chinese zodiac signs, I mean, uh, this year, for example, is the year of the water dragon. So, um, and the dragon is seen to be auspicious here. So, people are hoping that fertility rate will, would go up. Whereas, if it's the year of the tiger or the year of the goat, uh, then you know it's not not good to to produce. Uh, in the year of the tiger, for example, tiger girls are, are supposed to be uh, not very marriageable. So, <laughs> so issues. There. So, I mean, uh, so. So there is the cultural complication as well, but the, the idea here is that uh, fertility rate has been dropping very rapidly. I won't go through this particular chart, but which shows the, the growth rate. But um, if you just focus perhaps on the last line, last row, uh, in terms of the citizen uh, population that's growing at an annual rate of 1%, the permanent residents are growing at a rate of 6.5%, and the non-residents, which would be largely migrant workers, uh, that's growing at a standing 19%. So if you compare the uh, demography of um, post-independent Singapore, in the 1970s, uh, five years of the independence, we had a population of two million people, overwhelming majority of citizens, 90%, and very small percentages of uh, permanent residents and non-residents. Whereas, um, you know, I mean, a um, few decades down the road, in 2009, the total population is almost 5 million, and only under two-thirds are citizens. So a whole one-third of the population would be foreign, uh, either migrant workers or permanent residents. Um, and uh, so the whole, um, well, this particular talk is, is, is to try to think about how Singapore's current project of trying to become cosmopolitan is built upon uh, this kind of demographic and immigration uh, background. And um, much of the current project of becoming a cosmopolis, this is a term that the state uses, um, is Again, very much uh, state-led. Um, the, there are many projects which I won't have time to go into in terms of state-imposed projects to purposely cosmopolize the city and its people um, and uh, to invent a, 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 a new sort of cosmopolitan city. So, but it then has to struggle against the kinds of uh, racialized ideologies and policies that were so central to both colonial and the immediate post-colonial period. So uh, just to put it in a nutshell, this whole uh, idea of uh, Singapore becoming a cosmopolis is articulated by many of the political leaders. This is one by the former minister mentor Lee Kuan Yew, the founding father of Singapore. Says that to succeed, Singapore must be a cosmopolitan center to attract, retain, absorb talent from all over the world. Uh, we cannot keep the big companies out of the local league whether we like it or not, we're entering the region and we have to have a globalized economy, etc., etc., and sort of attracting talent in business, academia, performing arts, that's the way to vibrancy and securing our place in the global network of cities of excellence. So let me now focus on the three types of, of migration. Firstly, talent migration. This is uh, seen to be the key plank in re-engineering Singapore to compete effectively in a globalized knowledge-based economy. 
So the quest for talent is something that uh, seems to be absolutely crucial. Um, and again, in the words of uh, Lee Kuan Yew, this represents a final contest for nations in their struggle to stay ahead in the 21st century. So, um, and um, again, many different kinds of speeches which I won't go into, but uh, this idea that we should welcome the infusion of knowledge with foreign talent will bring that we must become a cosmopolitan global city, an open society where people from many lands can feel at home. And um, this is just one of, the, one of the very famous Chinese actresses, Gong Li, who has now become a Singapore citizen, so she's, she's leading the way to uh, sort of uh, attracting talent, in, in this case, uh, artistic talent. Um, this, this one is interesting. This is uh, from the Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong in a National Day where he speech uh, where he talks about today we get people from all over the world. We have people from Turkey, they are Portuguese, somebody from Venezuela, somebody from Morocco, even a Korean or two, some Russians. Uh, and they add color and diversity to the society. So our cuisine is something special. Singapore loves food. You want Korean ginseng chicken, you can get a real thing cooked by a Korean. You want Arab food, you can go to Arab street, you can eat shawarma, which is shish kebab, and you can smoke the hubble bubble, the water pipe. That's kind of difficult because, um, you know, in Singapore there are no smoking rules. So we have to think of something to do with that. And um, uh, the, the, the jewel, the crown here is this splendid wedding in Singapore where the groom came riding on a white horse. He was a Mawari, it's an Indian group, Indian businessman, very successful cast. So the zoo, the Singapore Zoo is now thinking of going to service by providing horses and elephants for weddings. So this is a sense of the kind of uh, society that, um, that um, the political masters would like to invent for the nation state. So there are a whole slew of different measures, which I won't have time to go into, to promote um, integration between immigrants and citizens, you know, millions of dollars spent on this. But remember, this is to do with people who have talent. So if you have no talent, then this doesn't apply to you, as you will see in a while. So this is talent-driven cosmopolitanization of Singapore, where, which has in many ways uh, gentrified many of the neighborhoods in Singapore. Uh, they are now nationality-based enclaves in private residential and condominium belts. Uh, and uh, it has created a lot of uh, uh, concern among Singaporeans. Um, the degree of cons uh, res resentment, for example, was very much felt in our last elections last year, uh, where the uh, main, uh, the, well, the PAP, which is the main political group, uh, lost uh, quite a number of seats as a result of uh, different kinds of uh, concerns, including this fear of foreign talent uh, taking away jobs, um, being paid too much, enjoying all the privileges of living in Singapore with none of the responsibilities that citizenship must bear. Sing Singapore males, for example, have to serve national service two years in the military, uh, and that's a, a source of contention. Okay, but, um, is truly transformed Singapore in many ways in terms of uh, boosting pro property prices, rental yields, and gentrifying uh, much of uh, Singapore uh, for a diverse globe-trotting crowd and uh, to serve a cosmopolitan clientele. So I think I have to rush here, but uh, so in other words, talent-driven cosmopolitanization of Singapore is very much state-driven. It is uh, linked to economic imperatives of creating Singapore is a talent capital of the global economy. Uh, it is a, a strategy that extends upwards, not sideways, as it places a premium on certain elitist forms of diversity and not others. So as this particular um, photograph shows, uh, both riding the train of globalization, foreign professionals are given a first-class welcome, whereas foreign construction workers on the right may not be treated in the same way. So I'm going to go on now to labor migration and looking at the foreign construction workers and so forth. Okay, there, it, it, Singapore is very labor short, so uh, we have often always been reliant on imported foreign labor, and with economic restructuring towards uh, service, finance, uh, high tech sectors, this has become uh, increasingly a, an issue. And in Singapore, labor migration, that's to say not talent migration, but labor migration, 
of uh, this, the unskilled or the semi-skilled is highly managed. It, uh, there's a work permit system, there's a dependency ratio, uh, there's a levy, and essentially, to cut a long story short, uh, labour migrants are admitted into the city-state on short-term work permits as disposable labour without any residency rights. So basically, uh, uh, they come on work contracts for like two years uh, and are treated as transient labour and they are expected to rotate out, out of the system within a few years. Uh, and, uh, but of course, in terms of numbers, uh, they are keenly felt in the uh, everyday landscape in terms of weekend on place. Uh, as you would see in um, pictures like this, this is a little India in Singapore. Uh, most of uh, the people in the photographs are foreign construction workers from India or Bangladesh. Uh, so they are new immigrants, not, not um, the um, older sort of uh, Indian population that's part of the citizenry. So these are largely transient workers who have come to Singapore to work for a couple of years. Um, same with uh, Filipino uh, domestic workers. We also have large numbers of Filipino and Indonesian domestic workers who are admitted, again, on short-term work contracts. Uh, in this case, um, along our ma major shopping thoroughfare, Orchard Road. Of course, you could say no sitting, no picnicking, but uh, who cares, right? I mean, uh, yeah. So, um, what's interesting is the absence of labour migrants from state-driven cosmopolitan discourses. Uh, these low-skilled, low-paid migrant workers seem to have no foothold at all in the uh, whole discourse of making Singapore a uh, cosmopolis. It, instead, uh, much of the discourse is largely negative, focusing on um, the fact that they are a public nuisance, and uh, the state is also complicit in constructing foreign workers as outsiders with no residency rights. So again, um, the uh, Singaporean unease with large numbers of migrant workers, I, um, sort of um, asking for more security measures, relocating them elsewhere, and so forth, um, basically speaks of a, a kind of spatial politics of exclusion that in, is in some ways reminiscent, uh, unfortunately, of a sort of colonial mentality uh, in the past where Asians were also tr uh, treated as, as outsiders in their own land. Um, what I would like to stress though, to be a bit more uh, optimistic about the situation, is that uh, I do think that there are alternative cosmopolitan visions emerging, uh, not from the state, but from Singapore's fledgling civil society. I have to stress the word fledgling because uh, we have, a, this is in the context of a very strong state, and a rather weak uh, civil society, but uh, what has in some ways hardened me quite, quite a lot is that in recent years, um, the rights and welfare of migrant workers, these large numbers of construction workers, domestic workers, have been, in my mind, one of the leading edges in progressive development within the civil society landscape. And um, it's kind of um, interesting that it is the, the plight of migrant workers that have become um, a key a turning point for civil society, uh, largely because there was uh, several cases of um, just growing sense of dismay and outrage, starting with uh, women's movements, um, largely to do with the abuse of uh, domestic workers, foreign domestic workers in Singapore, some of them um, were very badly abused, a uh, couple were, were, were died I mean, uh, because of the abuse and that basically uh, galvanized uh, Singapore society and especially the women's groups to action um, and since then, and this is several years ago, there's been uh, the growth of a broad range of NGOs focusing on migrant labour, uh, including service-oriented groups as well as uh, advocacy groups trying to uh, advocate for better rights uh, for um, foreign workers. And um, in their discourse, um, there is, well, in terms of services, there's of course the usual ambulance services to address the plight of the disadvantaged, but also uh, human rights kind of campaigns for a, a Sunday off uh, in employment contracts and so forth. Many of the domestic workers, for example, don't have a day off. In the, in the contract, so that, that's been something that uh, civil society has been uh, trying to fight. And um, in, in this particular um, 
battle, um, many of the groups have drawn on international human rights discourses, which, which is interesting because in Singapore there is an allergy to uh, discourses to do with human rights. Uh, but also drawing on other ideologies like, um, you know, that we should have a culture welcome and to make Singapore a home for, for all. So using some of these kinds of ideological discourses, uh, some more acceptable to the state than others, uh, to press the point that uh, migrant workers should be treated as part of Singapore society. So, um, to summarize that, so whilst the state has systematically focused on migrant labor as an economic resource, basically as disposable labor, uh, several society groups in recent years have been very active in humanizing migrant worker issues and rendering these issues more visible. Of course, we have to contend with the strength of state hegemony and, and a rather depoliticized culture amongst the citizens. So much of this development is incipient, um, but I would say that it's, it's at least heartening to see some of these, um, the growth of um, cosmopolitan ideals uh, in relation to migrant workers. So through the looking glass of civil society, cosmopolitan ideals, which extends sideways to include not just the foreign talent that the state valorizes, but also the large numbers of less skilled migrant workers can perhaps be, be glimpsed, and uh, if you want to be optimistic, I mean, uh, about this. But my last uh, sort of uh, set of uh, migration issues I want to talk about is marriage migration. And uh, again, this is something that has grown tremendously in, in Singapore. Um, and, and in terms of cross-nationality marriages, that is to say a citizen spouse marrying a foreign spouse, it is now about 40% of all marriages. So every year, 40% of uh, Singaporean marriages involves a foreign spouse. This particular uh, picture here is um, one stream of this kind of uh, international marriage. Um, largely, uh, Singaporean blue-collar worker, male blue-collar workers have not been able to find a Singaporean wife. I mean, um, they, they think that the Singaporean women are too career-minded, too sort of uh, fussy, and, uh, and so forth. So, and in, in, in the hope of securing a docile, subservient, no gentle um, spouse, uh, wife, basically they've been looking at the region. And in Singapore now, there are marriage agencies uh, that recruit uh, Vietnamese women as brides. Uh, in this case, uh, these are three young women who have come up to Singapore and you can travel from Vietnam to, to Singapore because in one month uh, free uh, without visa because we're all part of the ASEAN nations. So, and they are basically wandering around, well, placing themselves on the short front here in the hope that a uh, Singaporean man would come and marry one of them. So, uh, so that's, and they have one month basically. So if they can secure a husband within the one month, then they would have succeeded because the visa lasts for one month. So, um, and, uh, so, so this is interesting in some ways, and again, I don't intend to go into the statistics, I think. Um, so on websites and all that, I mean, uh, this kind of service. Um, I have to say that there are major issues with this form of marriage migration because the foreign wives, uh, their residency rights are dependent on husbands. They do not receive uh, residency or citizenship rights on marriage. Uh, they are seen as dependents of the husbands. So uh, if anything happens to the marriage, uh, they will lose everything and they have to, they have to exit the nation state. So, uh, and uh, that's a major concern for, some of, for many of them. Um, they are also not allowed to work whilst they are on a social visit pass and they have to depend on their husbands to apply for residency and citizenship rights for them. So that's been uh, a major issue. Um, I think I have no time to talk about this but it's the children of the mixed marriages but I have to skip all that. Um, yeah. So I think what I wanted to stress is that um, marriage migration, which is uh, it, it, uh, a major form of immigration these days in Singapore, um, does raise various issues uh, in terms of the status of the women themselves uh, because they are incorporated into the nation state 
only via their roles and identities within the family. So they are incorporated in the nation state as a wife, as a mother, as a daughter-in-law, not in their own rights. So that's one, one issue. So the state policy is one, in my mind, of non-policy. They are seen to be dependents, reliant on husbands, uh, and um, they well, um, in that particular country and state, they have very few rights. And uh, the contrast here is with uh, civil, in terms of civil society. It's, civil society, as I've tried to show, show, has been very active when it comes to migrant workers. But to, to date, it has paid little attention to immigrant wives. And the reason for that, I think, is to do with the fact that um, immigrant wives are not seen as labor, so they are seen as Within, within the private sphere of the, the, of the family and therefore not something that uh, uh, civil society concerns itself with. Okay, I'm going to draw to a close uh, by just summarizing. Uh, first of all, in terms of talent migra migrants, talent migrants migration is definitely inextricably aligned with the cosmopolitan project of the state and seem to be compatible with the economic and uh, cultural aspirations of the global city. And um, given its multicultural legacy, I mean, um, one would think that it would be easy for Singapore to incorporate uh, talent migrants into the city state, but um, there are also certain issues to do with uh, social acceptance and integration of the transnational elite into Singapore society. Um, so, in contrast, for labor migrants, um, this is a group, a very, very large group that's ignored by the state, which uh, has been taken up largely within civil society, where, in my mind, they, they have provided the leading edge in pushing for a cosmopolitanism that's broad enough to include these large numbers of migrant workers as socio-political subjects with some rights and not just as an economic resource as the state portrays them. So this, of course, is again not unproblematic because of the, um, well, the state's long-standing allergy for, to human rights discourses. And finally, for marriage migrants, marriage migrants elsewhere in Asia, in Korea, for example, has been a significant force in um, producing, in Korea, which is just 10 years ago, a rather homogenous country, uh, there's at least this whole rhetoric of multiculturalism and this um, sort of um, expect expectation uh, that it will diversify Korean society. In Singapore, the irony is this. Singapore is already a multicultural society, but um, the incorporation of marriage migrants haven't been uh, as uh, active a force in creating more progressive development Partly because marriage migrants are basically incorporated based on a social problems kind of template, so they are seen to be like women who are vulnerable and therefore not um, not seen to be part of the more progressive stance towards uh, multiculturalism. So in my mind, this is a missed opportunity. I mean, uh, here of not discerning the possibilities of harnessing cosmopolitan subjectivities for a new generation from hybridized families that would be the outcome of these, um, these marriage migrants. Yeah, so, okay. I'll start. Brenda, thank you so much for your uh, presentation, which is really thought-provoking, and uh, I think that it, you have presented the issues which are becoming uh, very important here in Russia as well. Uh, and I guess that we now opening the floor for discussion and comments. Uh, so, sure, вопросы, комментарии. Well, thank you very much, Brenda. It's extremely interesting society that you're describing, of course. I wonder if you could uh, fill in a little bit about this uh, talent migration, which is obviously uh, treated very generously uh, and uh, I want to see that uh, you know, coming to Singapore under those circumstances would be an population community. But I wonder uh, who are the talent migrants, where do they come from, how many of them 
them up to this day. Because I'm sure that you know, coming to Singapore for a while is a wonderful career option for the, a great many people from different parts of the world. Uh, I would suspect that they are not staying there in raising their families in Singapore in the long run. Are there any who do and where do they come from? So the state's um, strategy is, uh, well, the, the exhortation is to be race blind when it comes to talent. Anyone with talent, I mean, uh, and if there's a need for you, I mean, uh, whether it's scientific talent, academic talent, artistic talent, or, you know, um, to um, lead the MNCs and uh, business and so forth, uh, there's supposed to be a red carpet welcome and uh, many sort of um, incentives have been given for attracting talent because the uh, idea here is that Singapore has very few resources with well, nothing basically, you know, one tiny blue island so um, if we, this is a state rhetoric that if we don't build up a, a talent pool and become like a talent capital of the, the new knowledge based economy then uh, there is no future for Singapore. Its own population base seems to be far too small to produce the kind of talent needed for the global, for globalized future. So that's, that's the stance. The, uh, so it, it, in, in other words, it's really people from everywhere and anywhere. Uh, as, as you could see, it includes Russians. I mean, uh, and I do have Russians as my colleagues I mean, in, in Singapore, in the in university. But the bulk of them would come from Asia, largely China and India. Um, and that's um, uh, partly a, a result of demographics, but also partly a result of the fact that Singapore does position itself as an Asian society where no Chinese and Indians may find uh, a certain comfort level. So we do have Western expatriates as well as Asian expatriates, and the various studies have shown that um, the likelihood for uh, foreign talent, as we call them, to transit to become a permanent resident is actually quite high, uh, but the transition from permanent resident to citizenship would be uh, rather low. As I said, uh, there's also the national service barrier that's uh, negatively seen by, by many as a step towards citizenship. Uh, so. The bulk of people who do take up citizenship, um, the various surveys have shown, tend to be Asian expatriates. So Chinese or Indian um, immigrants uh, would think of a long-term settlement in Singapore, and their children would then to take up national service, which um, some of them have embraced. Uh, amongst uh, Western expatriates, uh, the rate of taking up citizenship will be very, very low. Спасибо. Еще вопросы, комментарии? So, I have a question. I, in, in, in seeing this uh, appeal for talent, um, I sense the uh, presence of Richard Florida. Has Richard Florida been to Singapore? Um, is he a hero? And um, I'm then thinking about the next implication of Richard Florida which is tolerance is the great asset uh, that attracts the talent, but Singapore has not been notable for its talent. So, I mean, excuse me, for its tolerance. So, my, and if you're going, of course, toward, toward gays, which are the center of Richard Florida's, you know what I'm talking about. So, is there a stress in that regard, and how does that play out? Florida is definitely a known name in Singapore. I mean, quoted in policy documents and so forth. I mean, his index is... So I don't think he's actually been to Singapore, but uh, definitely, I mean, uh, his, his work is, is known, I mean, is well known in Singapore and uh, cited as well, because um, part of being a global city, a cosmopolitan city, would be creativity. So um, there has been many, a lot of attempts to remake Singapore and to make it uh, more creative, okay, I mean, uh, and uh, in some ways this has succeeded in terms of infrastructure, uh, the government has definitely poured in a lot of money into uh, recreating sort of uh, theatres and music halls and all that which were absent, we were, I would say, very much a cultural desert, say 10 years ago, but Singapore is transformed quite, quite a while. 
more contentious would be issues to do with a more bohemian culture, which uh, Florida would advocate. That, would, that does run into all kinds of ironies and contradictions um, in terms of um, policies to do with um, um, gays and so forth. So definitely uh, it's more open um, amongst my colleagues now in academia and um, many of the scientists and all that would, would um, that's not seen as an issue anymore, and, uh, including um, some leaders who would be openly gay and therefore uh, would not have been acceptable, say, 10, 20 years ago, but uh, that's perfectly fine now. But of course, there are still sort of um, very strict sort of policies to do with um, the, um, yeah, that, that have not been um, dismantled as yet. So, um, it's a very contradictory kind of situation. I, I, I would say that uh, if you were to summarize basically the infrastructure or that, uh, but whether you can just create buzz and, and creativity by just infrastructure is a major question. Thank you. I see a lot of parallels between the situation you're describing in Singapore and what I observe in Moscow. But um, it seems that the difference, at least that I can see in Moscow, is that even in internally, there is, there is um, a lot of migration from other parts of Russia. And in many ways, uh, Moscow is a very um, multicultural city without an ideology of multiculturalism or without this overt ideology of cosmopolitanism. Uh, I'm wondering if, if you can comment, because you mentioned in the different, um, with the different kinds of migration, you said within civil society, there is some questioning of the policy towards labor migration, but not towards, say, marriage migration. And in terms of this, can you talk a bit about the place within the ideology of cosmopolitan, cosmopolitanism for other kinds of rights besides, or other kinds of tolerances, if you will, besides just um, tolerance for, for different ethnicity, this kind of picture-perfect melting pot image? Do you think that cosmopolitanism connects to uh, issues of tolerance uh, for people of different sexualities or uh, attention to issues faced by um, women, for example, within the society. And is there any sense of this, of these diff uh, that cosmopolitanism could include these different kinds of tolerances as well, not just foreign or ethnic? I think you put the finger uh, where it really uh, at, at the sort of at the pulse of uh, Singaporean style cosmopolitanism. There's a cosmopolitanism that's still very much sewn to the multiracial framework. I mean, um, so Singapore is a highly racialized society, so everybody carries an identity card. You have a race, and that defines uh, a number of things, like uh, what language you learn in school. If you're Chinese, you have to learn Chinese. If you're Malay, you have to learn Malay. You, you know, I mean, uh, a, a Chinese child cannot learn, in, uh, even if, if he or she wants to, uh, an Indian language, for example. So, and um, there are housing quarters which are built around race to prevent ghettoization. So, cosmopolitanism is a bit of a, a gloss that is built upon a highly racialized society. I mean, it's racialized from its, its colonial roots. I mean, uh, that's how society, the, the society that the political elite inherited from the past was one that's, uh, where race is something that's uh, talked about quite a bit. So my sense is that we're still struggling even with that tension between multiracialism, multiculturalism on one hand, and cosmopolitanism. I mean, uh, that's, so the words are used, but the meanings behind the words uh, needs to be interrogated. Um, there is um, 
little still uh, that stretches cosmopolitanism to, to encompass other kinds of rights, I mean, like gender, sexuality, and all that. I mean, the discourse on that is, I would say, uh, quite silent. So um, it's very incipient. I mean, it, yeah. But I suppose I want to be optimistic about my own society, hoping that um, what we see in civil society these days would be a, a guidepost to the future, where the openness of the discourse um, in civil society will develop. I mean, uh, so the hope is that uh, in 10 years' time, if I have to give the same talk, I mean, uh, there will be a, 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 a more expansive sense of what cosmopolitanism means. Right now, it's still uh, very much a cosmopolitanism that's uh, very much tied to economic nationalism and the multicultural framework. Да, я вообще ожидала, что из Москвы хотя бы кто-то из России задаст вопрос, потому что я думала, что это такой больной вопрос для нас, потому что вот, например, сюда меня привез замечательный узбек, который всю свою жизнь прожил в Таджикистане, сейчас работает в Москве, и агитировал меня всю дорогу голосовать за Путина. Hello, my name is Anna Esparza and uh, I'm the representative of Moscow State University, so I'm Tom Velos. And I have several questions. As far as I have understood you, um, marriage migration plays an important role in uh, Singapore, yeah? And uh, you have noted the uh, fact that there are Vietnamese girls uh, who every year come and, and are so much eager to be married with some uh, Singapore guys in order to improve their conditions of life and so on. So I would like her to um, maybe to define more precisely uh, the figures. Uh, as far as I understand, uh, male, yeah, so men are eager to marry and to find a wife from abroad. And what about women? So what's the proportion between men uh, and women in Singapore? And uh, so uh, how many men in Singapore uh, every year? If you have figures, yeah, I see that you have are married. Uh, and uh, why is it so? So can you comment on this fact? This is the first question. And then I have a second question. You have just said that there are some drawbacks uh, as you see them and there are some things to be improved. And can you say more um, precisely again what are these drawbacks as you see them? Because what you have told us just for Russia and for Moscow as well is just paradise. So that is why we are eager maybe to know for what you are longing for and for what you are eager to develop. Okay, thank you so much. So the first has to do with um, maybe a little, uh, to, to take a step back, Singapore, as I mentioned, is facing very rapid fertility decline. And much of this fertility decline that I, I, I showed a while ago has to do with the fact that um, marriages are being delayed and a non-marriage singlehood is, is on the rise. I mean, this is, I suppose, part of uh, socioeconomic development, uh, the fact that we're an urban society, I mean, um, and um, women are, they are always women, and the women, and the women are highly educated and um, not wanting to, not needing to get married to, to have a life, basically. So, so these trends, which are very much part of urbanized trends, uh, has uh, occurred at such a rapid rate in Singapore. So the uh, Singapore rates are highest amongst these two groups. The blue-collar work, uh, male workers, so men with uh, low educational levels, uh, uh, will be one group. And the other group amongst the women will be the university-educated women. And the two groups refuse to marry each other. So, uh, because, uh, so um, again, it is the same people's fault it is, but, uh, you know, I mean, uh, the, the women um, in Asian cultures generally do not marry down in, uh, in terms of, you know, the social economic status and so forth, and the men are uh, just still thinking that they will find a docile wife somewhere the university educated women are not going to deliver that. So this has led to the blue collar worker men looking to the region, to the poorer developing countries in the region, Vietnam, Indonesia, sometimes Thailand, um, Philippines, uh, for, for brides. And um, 
some of this happens through social networks, but in, in Asia, what's interesting is that uh, uh, some of this occurred through commercial agents. So, you know, as you saw, that, you know, it's, uh, the, the, the brokers for marriage have yeah, basically seen this as a business of matchmaking the poor Vietnamese rural woman who wants a better life and uh, not uh, highly educated but still richer uh, Singaporean. So uh, the figures you see there, the blue line would be the men. So obviously, the Singaporean men marrying a foreign spouse is represented by the blue line. Uh, that's the majority of it all. So the question is, what's, what's happening to the university educated uh, women? Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> that's, that's um, uh, well, I mean, uh, they go to conferences. <laughs> Well, I mean, uh, there's, uh, I've interviewed some of these, I mean, there's no need to be for marriage. I mean, uh, life is, you know, comfortable as it is. I mean, uh, and, and um, some of them are marrying uh, foreigners as well, as you can see from the pit line, but that hasn't really increased uh, dramatically at all. And uh, some uh, would, be, would be married sort of um, Western men I mean, uh, with Perhaps, perhaps, I don't know about this one, I mean, more liberal ideas as to what women should be and so forth. So, so that's, that's the pattern uh, right now. And um, so in terms of uh, how this is related to, um, well, cosmopolitanism, I mean, the point which I, I, I didn't have time to make also has to do with the children. Because to me, uh, international marriage is a great opportunity of transforming society from within, from inside the family itself. So yes, uh, Vietnamese women who come and marry Singaporean men will probably face a very hard time in Singapore and so forth. But my hope is that uh, this, this will lead to uh, a, a force that uh, probably the state will be able to reckon with, which, which will be children of mixed marriages having this wider sort of uh, cultural empathy for, you know, because they, they do have many other resources to draw on in terms of their cultures. So, uh, I, I, very quickly, for example, right now it's very difficult for these children to mix, mix marriages because the CNIO category uh, doesn't fit that. They, they're all sort of uh, lumped into this category called others. And as this quote shows, this disgruntled new citizen, uh, a Caucasian man with a Malaysian wife of Indian heritage and three children, two from a previous marriage to a Chinese woman and one from this marriage. <laughs> he was unable to purchase public housing due to racial quotas, he laments. We don't fit a cookie cutter definition of race and to simply categorize us as others overlooks our unique land of race and culture. So I, it's still a major problem because of this, the, the, the strictures of the CNIO categorization. but. My, I suppose an optimist, my hope is that more of this will mean that the, the CMIO categories will, will just have to dissolve, will just have to become more porous, and uh, race will hopefully become less of an a, a issue uh, in, in, in the future when if people are just of different kinds. I don't know if that's my hope. Uh, I, I'm afraid we will have to finish on this optimistic note for Singapore at least. <laughs> Anyway, we are finishing. Thank you so much, Brenda, for your wonderful talk. And yeah, thank you so much.